So Coach Boyle, thank you so much for coming today. On behalf of the Temple University of Exercise and Sports Science Association and Washington State University's Kinesiology Club, we would like to welcome Coach Boyle today. Uh, right now, he is in the private sector and owns his own business, Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning, and he has worked with other professional sports teams around the Boston area with the Boston Bruins uh, the, uh, and all those other teams. So, Coach Boyle, thank you so much. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Yeah, we're doing well. So, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why you got into strength and conditioning in the first place? I'm just so curious to hear how you got into it. Well, I mean, I think I probably get into it the same reason that everybody gets into it in terms of I want it to be better. And so I started to train. Um, I always think, you know, the fact that I started writing, I write a lot. And one of the articles I wrote, you know, was sort of about the value of not being very good at something. And because I wasn't very good at sports, I had to start learning about training. So if you can imagine, you're looking at a real solid weirdo because probably 47, 48 years ago, I was down in my basement lifting weights. And, you know, I had a wall chart. I literally had like the York 110 pound set, which no one on this call will ever even remember. But, uh, you know, and a bench. And I mean, I was, I remember reading an article about Gail Sayers running sprints up a hill and I found a hill to sprint up. And I just always kind of gravitated towards it because I knew I needed something. I knew I needed an edge as an athlete. And then when I went to college, I played one year of college football and realized I was too small, too slow, too weak. And so then I really got seriously into lifting at that time with hopes that I would play college football, which I never did after my freshman year, but it put me on that path. And, uh, I always, you'll, I'll make a lot of book references in the next hour, but, um, outliers is one of my favorite books. And I always said like in, in the outliers moment, you know, they talk about you. Um, the big thing about outliers is trying to explain, do you sort of try to explain the unexplainable? Why do things happen? that you don't think should happen. You look at somebody like me, I show up at Springfield College in 1977 as a 17-year-old freshman. And one of the first guys that I meet is my dorm director, who's a guy named Mike Wojcik. If you are a student of strength and conditioning, you will know that Mike Wojcik and Tom Brady are tied for most Super Bowl rings in the NFL. Mike has six and Brady has six. Mike is a strength and conditioning coach, Brady is a player. But Mike has three with Dallas. He was in like the Jimmy Johnson, Troy Aikman, Michael Irvin years at Dallas and then moved on with the Patriots later and now actually just retired from Dallas probably at about 65, but he was my dorm director. So I kind of fell in with these people who were so far ahead. Mike at that time was a track and field coach. He was coaching the, uh, the throwers. And I started training with the throwers and hanging around with the throwers and lifting. And um, it was all very uh, serendipitous in a way. I, I don't know if it was well thought out or well planned out but i just ended up very much being in the right place at the right time with a lot of the right people now it looks like you're muted actually did you mute yourself i just did yes uh, good catch there um but yeah um i would definitely say that luck is a big part of this field and it's especially important to kind of like surround yourselves with, uh, you know, the people that can possibly get you those positions. So like, how would you, what, what would you advise for people to do in order to, you know, find those opportunities in strength and conditioning um, if they want to get their foot in the door, uh, you know, in the private sector, college or professional? I mean, it, it's interesting. It, it, it basically is what you did, you know, send an email, make a site visit. I always look at it and think if someone wants to work at Mike Boyle strength and conditioning and they've never been there, they don't want to work at Mike Boyle strength and conditioning. Do you know what I mean? Like people always say, Oh, I sent, Oh, I sent you a resume. And I'm always like, you sent a resume. Like, do you think anyone gets a job with a resume? I think that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. People said, Oh, I sent out a lot of resumes. And I'm like, Oh yeah. I was just shuffling through the mail on my desk looking for a strength and conditioning coach. I mean, it's, you know, it's, to me, it's idiotic that people think that that's how you get a job, but that's part of the process or the, the problem with college is they teach you these absurd things, you know, that, okay, you're going to go for four years and then you're going to learn how to write a resume and then you're going to mail them to everybody and someone's going to actually go looking through them. Like I look for it. If I'm looking to hire somebody, I'm thinking, 
who's been through our system, who's been here, who's interned, who do I know who's the next young rising star in the field? I never have to go to a pile of papers on my desk. I don't even keep, I always say whenever anybody, so we'll keep your resume on file. I'm like, they file it in the trash can. They, you know, they don't, they don't keep it. They're not going to actually look at that because they've already got their list. Anytime anybody calls me and asks me about a job, I have a list of people that I know would, that I would want to have considered for that job, regardless of what the job is. Uh, and a lot of times I'll ask them, okay, what do you, what can you pay? And then I'll know based on what they can pay, who the potential candidates for that job are. I always think, you know, if you want to, if you've got $25,000 to spend on a strength and conditioning coach, then you'll get a $25,000 strength and conditioning coach. You'll get a young kid just out of school who, you know, will can afford to, to live cheap for another year while they get their first job. You know, if you've got a hundred thousand dollars, you're in a whole different ball game in terms of who you might be able to get attracted to that job. But I think um, the biggest thing is <clears throat> you have to be creating your network. You've got to be getting out and, you know, and some of it, it's, it's how, you know, the, the art to that is how to do that without being an obnoxious pain in the ass is part of the deal with trying to create your network in terms of, just sending someone a polite email. Hey, I'd love to come by and, and visit. But I have people who say they'd love to come by and visit and then they stay for an hour. Oh, and they're like, okay, great. Thanks. Nice to meet you. And they leave. And you look and think, well, you didn't even want to come. Like you just, that was just a formality. Like, you know, if you're going to come, you should come to plan and stay and, and really learn and have a notebook and write stuff down and ask questions. That's the kid that I'm looking for. Not the kid who stops by for an hour. And then it's like, Oh, I gotta go, you know, but it's, I always say like success is really, really easy, but it's really, really hard, but it's really easy because if you're the type of person that is sort of the, the self-starter, the go-getter, the, you know, the person who says, you know, I'm going to come by and watch what you guys do. And you actually watch and you pay attention and you take notes and you don't make dumb comments and you don't start telling me, Oh, this is what I do. You know, it's amazing. The same thing you meet, you know, with young kids, you know, all of a sudden they, they meet you and they want to start telling you, what they do and how they train. And you kind of like, that isn't why you came. You came to observe, you came to learn. You didn't come to, to, you know, to impress me with, you know, what a great lifter you are, how much you've learned in your like two years of strength and conditioning. But so, you know, it's that ability to go somewhere and to be kind of understated and be a fly on the wall, but you know, not the fly that's, you know, buzzing around somebody's ear and because I even tell kids, it's funny, kids will come and ask, you know, can I shadow? And I've had to tell kids, shadow does not mean cast a shadow upon. Okay, it's a, it's a term, it's a descriptive term, because I've had kids literally follow me around. You know, you turn around and you bump into it and you're like, please, like, I get it, you can come, you can watch, you can shadow, but, but like, please, like, if I take two steps, don't take two right behind me. So, you know, it's all of that stuff. It's like, you know, it's getting there and, and just generally being, you know, presenting yourself as the type of person that someone would like to hire for their business. Or, you know, whether that is, like you said, it could be private sector, it could be collegiate, whatever it is, but presenting yourself as the type of person, the other problem that you run into in strength and conditioning, and you'll realize you don't have to ask me a lot of questions because I talk too much, but um, ego is a huge component of strength and conditioning, you know, because everybody that's trying to do strength and conditioning obviously probably likes to work out, right? So, you know, realizing going in there and saying, okay, I have to present myself as a person without an ego. This is, the, all, this is not about me. This coach that I'm meeting or this facility owner that I'm meeting, he doesn't care how much I can bench. He doesn't care what my abs look like. He doesn't care what I ate for lunch. Like none of the things that sort of the ego oriented, young, you know, excited person in the strength and conditioning field is all fired up about. It has nothing to do with what we're looking for. I always tell people I'm looking for someone with great, interpersonal skills that's what i want i want someone with unbelievable interpersonal skills and someone who looks the part but who knows what the part is i always said like if you're auditioning for the role of a refrigerator maybe some of the people in strength and conditioning might actually get jobs but you're probably not we always talk about the idea we want people that look athletic people that can move people that are going to be able to demonstrate sprinting and jumping and all of the things that are really important in strength and conditioning instead of like this. And it's more, uh, uh, unfortunately more of a male than female thing. But a lot of times you get this lunk who looks like they couldn't get out of the way of the bus if it was going to run them over. 
And they're like, oh, I want to be a strength coach. And you're like, no, you want to be like a weightlifting coach of some sort. But I don't know if you want to be a strength and conditioning coach. I don't know if that's really the direction that you're, um, you're moving in. So how's that for a long answer to a short question? No, I think that's a very long answer. And, uh, you know, I was like thinking about the definition of, you know, what strength and conditioning really is. And uh, it kind of like makes me think about my own experience and how, you know, the internships I've done um, have kind of like taught me, like, if you want to make yourself, you know, stand out, then you got to like, you know, be something else in a weight coach. So what kind of things do you guys, you know, do to separate yourselves from the field uh, with like your speed and agility, your plyometric training and everything like that? that you do at Mike Boyle's training. Yeah, I think if you think about this, you're training athletes. You're not training weightlifters. If you said, I want to be a powerlifting coach, then go be a powerlifting coach. If you want to be an Olympic lifting coach, then go be an Olympic lifting coach. If you want to be a strength and conditioning coach, then as you said, you know, that you're talking about plyometrics and you're talking about speed development, you're talking about unilateral training. There's so many things that, that are, that are critical to what we're trying to get accomplished. And people come a lot of times from this very one dimensional place of, well, I like, you know, I, I like lifting, you know, and you think about how sort of incredibly simplistic that is, oh, you like lifting. That's great. If you like lifting, I'm sure that's going to make you an absolutely model employee because you like lifting. The truth of the matter is I don't want anybody that likes lifting. Cause if you're really worried about working out, you're not going to be a good worker. And I always say when, whenever anybody's worried about their workouts, when that's like another like really negative vibe for me. You know, if people say things like, you know, when, when do we get to work out or how long do we get to work out? I'm always like, ah, eh, those are the wrong questions. And, you know, the wrong questions are about like, you know, hours and vacation days. And those are all the wrong questions. And they're questions that you might ask when you apply for a normal job, but being a strength and conditioning coach isn't a normal job. And so, you know, you've got to realize that you're going into an abnormal profession. You're going into a profession where a lot of the people routinely work 12 hours a day and work, you know, five and six days a week and some of them seven days a week. And, and they're not really interested in anybody who's worried about when they get to lift or when, you know, what day they get off or, you know, what time is lunch, and, you know, any of that stuff. You know, I always tell people, if you want to, if you want to know when lunch is, lunch is whenever there's a break in the action, you can eat your sandwich, go ahead. But if you're planning, you're thinking to be able to go out for an hour and, you know, have lunch with somebody, that's probably not going to happen. So it's just, it's a weird field. I have to admit, I mean, it's not, Coaching in any, you know, whether it's sport coaching or strength and conditioning coaching is not for any, for everybody. And strength and conditioning coaching, in all honesty, is in some ways the best and the worst of the fields. I think it's the best of the fields because you don't have to recruit. You're not on the road, you know, as opposed to regular college coaches, but it is year round. There's no, the, the strength coach doesn't get three months off in the summer or in the off season or whatever it is. The strength coach is expected to be there during the entire in-season time, the strength coach is expected to be around there the entire off-season time. When I was a college strength coach, I took one week off a year and that was it. And I usually took the week between Christmas and New Year's, which happens to be the most expensive week of the year to actually go on vacation. But before my wife and I had kids, we would go on vacation that week because that was the week that there was really nothing going on. There would be the least kind of invasive week in the training process. So it's... um. It's just, it's a different, it's a different kind of animal. And it's, the private sector is in some ways worse and in some ways better. And it's better because you get to control your hours um, more. So, you know, you're not worried about beating the football coach in and, you know, trying to get in there at five o'clock in the morning so you can make sure they see your car in the parking lot kind of thing, which I know a lot of collegiate strength coaches end up doing, but um, you know, there, there are pluses and minuses to both. Yeah, there's uh, no doubt about it. So I've actually listened to some of your podcasts and you've kind of like explained uh, the differences that you've seen with collegiate strength and conditioning in private sector. So like, what are some of the pros and cons that you see with collegiate strength and conditioning and in the private sector? The pro of collegiate strength and conditioning is you get the jersey, you get the wins and the losses. Do you know what I mean? There's more team identity. And I think when you're young, that may be a bigger piece of the puzzle for some people in terms of they, they want to be in that situation where they want to feel a part of something. Because I think for some people, it, it fills that void of maybe not a lot of times in strength and conditioning, maybe 
<clears throat> your career didn't finish the way that you wanted to and being able to really get you know involved in something at a really deep level is fun that's the the pro of the collegiate environment the negative of the collegiate environment is the coaches unfortunately every coach is an expert on training for their sport or at least they think they are and you spend your entire time dealing with this bullshit of you know somebody saying well when i played we did this and you're trying to explain to them that they played 30 years ago and that it's not the way that it is anymore but you ultimately work for them and they will ultimately get to decide kind of you know what the team is going to do when the team is going to rest when the team is going to have days off until you really build a relationship like I stayed at Boston University for 30 years because I built a great relationship with our head ice hockey coach and I was able to at that time then I had a lot of input in terms of I designed the practice schedule for the week I figured out what days we were going to take off what days we were going to lift we talked a lot about how long practices were going to be I had a a massive amount of input into the things that we were doing and and we won a lot and that can be addictive you know winning a lot and having a lot of input can really suck you into the process um you know private sector is sort of the opposite in terms of the number one thing that's best about the private sector no coaches no one around telling you what to do or how to do it or i think we should do this or why don't we do that you don't have anybody Nobody looks over your shoulder in the private sector. You're very much responsible for how things turn out with, uh, without any big external input. The negative there is that you have the athletes sometimes trying to, to drive the bus, so to speak, and the athletes telling you what they want to do and what they don't want to do. So, um, and when you're at the professional level in the private sector, in a way you do work for the athlete because now that person is paying you out of their personal funds to be their strength and conditioning coach. And again, much like with the college coach, you know, you've got to develop trust. Like for us, our athletes always do what we want them to do. So it's, it's really easy. Uh, we don't have to worry about um, kind of, you know, the guy say, oh, I don't want to do this kind of thing. Like we don't take anybody. If you don't want to do what we want you to do, go train someplace else. We're fine. We got enough people who want to train that we don't have to worry about having people, but in the beginning, you may not have that luxury and you may have to get into more of the back and forth with the player, or you may have to deal with agents. That's another thing, you know, and they can be a pain in the ass in a way that a coach can be a pain in the ass. So you've got that. But the nice thing about the private sector, you can make as much money as you want. If you go into the, you know, you go into collegiate strength and conditioning and you take the, you know, the third assistant job or whatever it is, you're not going to make a lot of money. You're going to work a shitload of hours. You're not going to make a lot of money. If you go into the private sector and you're good, you work a lot of hours, you make a lot of money. So the great thing about the private sector is you can make more money much sooner and you can be sort of the master of your own destiny a little bit more in the private sector. So, and it's a little more normal existence. You don't have games on the weekends. If you, if it's a game, it might be, Hey, I'm going to watch one of my players play on TV, you know, and I can sit at home with a bag of potato chips and a beer if I want to and watch somebody on TV, as opposed to thinking that, you know, no, we got a game on Saturday and I got to be there at eight o'clock in the morning for a one o'clock game while we're getting ready. Or I got to meet with recruits before the game or, you know, there's all kinds of things that are that are going to get laid on top of the um, the collegiate sector thing that aren't involved in the private sector thing. So they really do. When you look at it, there is a very clear cut kind of group of pluses or minuses. And you have to look at that. You just have to look and think, OK, what do I really want? Do I want to be a a 12 hour day, six to six college strength coach who's got as many bosses as I have sports teams, or do I want to be maybe the same 12 hour day, six to six private sector person, but who's getting paid by the hour and, and making money for every hour that they're there. So they're, they're kind of, you know, in some ways they're the same, in some ways they're vastly different. And uh, you know, they kind of like, you know, brings me to like my next question I have. Um, it kind of definitely seems like the collegiate side from, you know, my experience as well. Uh, there's like so much structure. Uh, do you feel like with some of your experiences that you had in collegiate strength and condition, you were kind of like restricted in some ways that you wanted to train your athletes or? What do you I think? never felt restricted because I was sort of, all, I was in on the ground floor and, and so there never was that feeling uh, really, but I know some people that are like, you know, particularly if you're in the football world, you're going to have a football coach who there are going to be things that they want the guys to do. 
you know, we want them to do this. We, we want them to train in this way. You know, there's some coaches who want you in the room, literally blowing a whistle. There's some coaches who say stuff like, I don't want to see anybody standing around. So in some ways they're saying, you know, figure out a way where they can work out without resting. You'll get all sorts of strange kind of requests. And a lot of collegiate will be based on what does the team that wins do? And it's, I had this conversation years ago with one of our football coaches. Uh, uh, another local team had won the national championship. And his suggestion, he said, I think you should go up there and talk to their strength coach. And I looked at him, I said, coach, two years ago, they fired the guy who had your job, not the guy who had my job. I said, the reason they won the national championship is because they fired their head coach and got a new head coach, not because they changed strength and conditioning coaches. The strength and conditioning coach is the same guy that was there before they, you know, when they weren't good. And he was a little bit offended, but I, but I was a little bit offended because he's thinking, oh, they won the national championship. You should go up there and check out what they're doing. And I was kind of like, well, what they did is they fired the guy with your job and hired somebody else. They didn't fire the guy with my job. But that's the stuff that you get stuck with in the collegiate environment is, like, as I said, because these guys are, you know, or women sometimes are effectively your bosses. And ultimately, you probably won't get to dictate what the athletes do as much as they will. I was really lucky again at Boston University. We had a great athletic director my last maybe... 10 years that I was there. And one of the things that I did is I went to him and said, um, I think I should be treated the same as the training room. You know, in the athletic training, coaches can't go into the athletic training room and say that player's not hurt. I need them to go to practice. They don't get to do that. They don't get to dictate. The athletic trainers are treated as professionals who know what they're doing. And as a result, they get to do their job. I said, I think I should get the same treatment that the athletic trainers did. And he was like, yeah, you're right. You should. So he literally had a staff meeting one time and he said, here's the deal. He said, Mike's the head strength conditioning coach, which means he's in charge of strength and conditioning. I expect you to not go into the weight room and start telling him what you think, you know, no more than you would go in. We had a woman named Maria Hudson, who was our head trainer. And he said, no more than you would go into Maria's room and tell Maria how you expected her to treat an injury or how long a player should be out. Uh, we'll have the same thing, but that's a super progressive AD who was really bright and was not a guy from the sports world, which helped us. Uh, he was intelligent enough when you, when you presented a reasonable point to him, he kind of went like, yeah, you're right. That's, that's a good point. The coach shouldn't be in there trying to tell you what to do, but that's not going to be everywhere. So, um, and again, and sometimes, you know, you could literally be sort of forcibly compromised in the sense that someone could ask you, I mean, I've had situations where coaches have said, I want to do this. And I had one situation where I told the coach, I said, okay, if you want me to do that, you need to place that in writing. I said, I want it in writing. I want an email sent to me. And I want to copy the athletic director on that, that this is your directive. I said, because I'm not in agreement. I said, and I want him to, I want our the athletic director to know that you are requiring me to do this as a condition of my employment. And all of a sudden he looked and was like, oh, maybe we won't do that. But, you know, you have to, it's tough. I mean, you, you can really get into some uh, difficult situations in the collegiate environment that you don't have, to, you don't have to deal with it in the private sector. Yeah. And I guess, for example, um, you know, this is just my observation from what I saw from your facility. Um, I, I would agree that, I, I mean, I think you would agree that a lot of collegiate uh, programs have, you know, a lot of their athletes back squat, for example. And from what I saw from your facility, you had everybody doing a single leg version instead, whether it was like a split squat, a skater squat, et cetera. Um, so I guess like where I want to take this is, uh, you know, do you believe that, uh, you know, programs should prioritize more single leg training instead of bilateral training? Oh, absolutely. I mean, without a doubt, I think, I think bilateral training uh, effectively, a lot of it's just dumb. It's just dumb old school, the way we always did it kind of stuff and people ignore athletes getting injured they ignore physiology they ignore science and my thing is and i've said this over and over again is if you are really studying training unilateral training should just make sense to you and if you really look from a neurological standpoint i actually think that bilateral training up to a point or at or past a point probably makes you worse athletically 
because your body is not a bilateral mechanism. We are not like kangaroos or rabbits or whatever. We do not move synchronously bilaterally. So, you know, if you see, like, you don't think of any sporting activity where somebody's hopping around on two legs. And, you know, I said that the, the notable exception is we actually do utilize two legs simultaneously at the same time. But sometimes I think for most, even most strength and conditioning coaches, that's like too intellectual a stance. You know, when you start to look at it and say, if you think about neurology and you look at how the body works in opposition, how it's you know, right arm and left leg and left leg and right arm. Um, it makes so much sense that we should be training that way. And I, I use the example all the time. Um, if things work the way that most strength and conditioning coaches wanted them to work, then you theoretically should be able to jump off two legs twice as high as you can jump off one leg. But if you ask 90% of the people in the world to dunk a basketball, they will grab the ball in their right hand and they will jump off their left leg they will only jump off one leg not two because they know that they will produce higher force outputs in a unilateral sense than they will in a bilateral sense your body then there's a lot of there's not a lot but there's a decent body of research that says that um your body finds bilateral exercise neurologically confusing and it actually sort of self-limits like you won't get me as strong as you should get when you do nothing but bilateral stuff and we've seen that with some of the unilateral stuff that we do people use loads that are, I mean, I actually have some great video of uh, one of my former assistants, this kid, Devin McConnell, who was at UMass Law. He's got his kids doing, you know, and it's a, it's a hand, hand assisted split squat, but he had guys doing 500 pounds, hockey players doing 500 pound, you know, safety hand assisted split squats. I mean, and the, the kid in the video does it so easily. Actually, I'll show it to you because I can screen share. So let me, let me just give me two seconds and I'll pull it up. Um, yeah, you'll be able to uh, share it now. It just yeah. enabled it through the security. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can find this. Because, you know, when, when you look at some of the things from kind of a, an evidentiary standpoint, it, the evidence is really compelling, but most people just don't want to look at it. They, they, they're so, um, I guess, they're so set in the ways that they think that they don't want to uh, accept the fact that they might be wrong. And I get it, it's, it's hard. It's not, it's not easy to. So. It's kind of like uh, the fawns in uh, Happy Days. Correct. Exactly. Yeah, it's funny. That's the I used that slide today in my presentation. Um, all right, let's see. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to share my screen. It's weird. My Zoom is behaving oddly. Do that. I've never had trouble screen sharing before, but it's not letting me. So we may not be able to see this, unfortunately. Um, hey, hey, Mike. Yeah. And how you doing, Coach Boyle? Um, I have a question that's been kind of eating away from can't see in the way at me um since we got on call i'm um, in a previous no, call earlier. can you guys see this screen then don't lose that question can you see this right. now that the kid squatting yes we can okay so yes, watch can. this is 515 I have some issues with how, like, I, you know, 
have been better, whatever. But the, the point is, that kid's on one leg with 515 pounds, and he moves it like it's 200 pounds. I don't think if we put 1,000 pounds on the bar, he'd be able to do that at the same depth or at comparable depth or anything like that. And that's one of the things that we've seen is that the body seems to be ex really accepting of the unilateral stimulus because it's the way you work. It's the way your brain works. It's the way you're wired. When you're trying to do really heavy bilateral stuff, it's almost like you're trying to run, you know, a current through the system that it's not intended to take. So you, you self-limit. And sorry, this gentleman that's on the screen, ask your question now. I apologize. Did I lose him? Yeah, so I have a question. Um, that's been eating away. No, I'm still here. Wait, I mean, um, from that's rain, it's raining from a previous um Zoom conference call earlier with him. But in, in the conference call, he mentioned on the concept of people training, um, in the aspect of like crawling, prowling, and stuff along those lines. And I was just wondering, how do you implement? those movements into your programming when you do when you do come up with a program uh, stuff like that would be like, where do you find the best to implement it um like what a lot it's going to be one of two places we're either going to look at it as warm-up or we're going to look at it as core work and generally speaking if it's warm-up then it's in the warm-up it's before we do anything else if it's um if it's core work then generally it's going to be done the way like we will use what we would call tri-sets. So basically we would generally be doing an upper body exercise, a core exercise, and then a lower body exercise or an upper body exercise, a stretching exercise, and then a lower body exercise. And we would be rotating through those three. So that's where some of that stuff would, would kind of find its way in. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And along the lines of the unilateral, um, unilateral capacity, are you really trying to, um, we call it, depict how he's able to squat, single leg squat, 515 on, 515 on one leg, but you don't think it would be able to translate over if you used to put like a thousand pounds and do that bilaterally? Is that what you're trying to? Yeah, I don't, I don't even think it would be close. That's the difference. What we're seeing is that it's, it's not close. Like we've, We've seen new, like I could just keep pulling up example after example of people doing weights where you think there's no way that that person can do double that weight or double that external load in a bilateral exercise. And so, I mean, the, the reality is that, and this, again, the bilateral deficit research has been out there for a really long time, but we continue to ignore it a lot in strength and conditioning. So bilateral deficit is basically the idea that the sum of right plus left is going to be greater than when you use right and left together. And they did these initial studies with things like, like a hand grip dynamometer where they might have somebody grip right hand, grip left hand, and then grip two hands. Right plus left is going to exceed both hands together. The only reason you can account for that would have to be some sort of neurological limitation. Because if you think about it, if I squeeze as hard as I can with my right and I squeeze as hard as I can with my left, then I squeeze as hard as I can with both, those numbers should be the same, but they're not. If we do the same thing, and not that I'm a leg extension fan, but they did the same thing with leg extension. Leg extension right plus leg extension left plus leg extension with, or is greater than leg extension with two legs. And they've done these studies numerous times. We're just seeing it in big, major muscle group type exercises. So that's the neurological side. The, the, then the other side is the functional side in terms of when we're doing like, you know, that's why I said, besides rowing, if you ask yourself, where are the bilateral sports skills? They're extremely few and far between, you know, maybe, you know, some sort of, you know, direct jump up for a rebound in basketball, maybe somebody jumping up for a block in volleyball, but they're, they're really, pure bilateral activities are pretty isolated in the sports world. So you've got like a neurological basis for unilateral training. You've got um, a functional anatomy basis for unilateral training. What you don't have is a general acceptance in the profession of unilateral training. There's just still, you know, there's still a lot of meatheads. There's a lot of, 
you know, the West side type guys, you know, who just think, and this is the other thing I always tell people, if getting strong worked the way people want you to believe it works, there would be significantly more power lifters in the Olympics in other sports, because people try to make you think that the stronger you get, the faster you be, the stronger you get, the better you'll be. But if you look at power lifters, they don't tend to be great athletes. I would say, and in truth, it's probably almost rare to find a power lifter that is a great athlete where you look and think, oh, this guy, like he's a hell of a basketball player or a hell of a lacrosse player or a great ice hockey player. You don't generally see that. You see those people and think they're very good at power lifting. They've become really good at bilaterally moving significant amounts of weight in, you know, three lifts. So. Yeah. Uh, I totally and, understand that. Yeah, and Mike had said, you know, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. There's no, there's no need that, to not ask because uh, we got about 20 minutes left. And I always say this: uh, you have two choices. You can either you can either look dumb by asking the question or stay dumb by not asking the question. So I always am in favor of looking dumb by asking the question. I have a question. Okay. Hi, Coach Boyle. My name is Caroline. I'm a cert certified strength and conditioning coach based out of New Jersey. And it's a pleasure to meet you. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I have two questions, actually. The first one is what's something that you know now that you wish you knew when you were just starting out in the industry? Because I'm, I'm 24. I'm just trying to get my feet wet. So I'm just kind of trying to, you know, better understand you know where i'm at and any any advice you might have um, so the one thing i always tell people the one thing i wish i'd known then that i know now is that there's probably a reason that you have two eyes and two ears and one mouth <laughs> I, I was probably the annoying guy that i kept trying to tell everybody else not to be when i was a 24 year old and i probably talked too much and listened too little uh so i think that's the biggest thing is when you're young, you don't know what you don't know. You only know what you do know. And a lot of times, you know, there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect and Dunning, -Kruger, Dunning and Kruger were two researchers and they basically studied, um, I think they studied acquisition of skills. And one of the things that they realized is that the people who overestimate their knowledge level, the high, the most are the youngest people that they surveyed. So in general, in strength and conditioning, the people who are very much like, I know this is the way, tend to be in their early 20s. And the people who are very much like, ah, it depends, I don't know, you know, I'm a little confused, tend to be like me. And, you know, in their, in their 50s and 60s. So I think that would be the biggest thing is just realizing that, that there's a tremendous amount that you have to learn and being really open and listening and, and asking yourself, like I would say with someone like me, you look at someone like me and say, why is this guy who's been doing this for years saying all this crazy shit that he's saying? And what you'd have to think about is probably because he really believes that it's true. You know, yet people would see it as conventional. So I think that's the biggest thing is, is just not, not having this mindset of this is how I, this is how I train. This is how I want to train. This is what I think is the best way to do it. And constantly looking at someone or other people and saying, okay, who's having success? Why are they having success? What are they doing? What are these people doing maybe that I'm not doing? As opposed, you know, what we do instead is, you know, we search for confirmation bias. We search for people like us doing what we're doing so that we can feel good about what we're doing. Instead of looking around and saying, hey, I want to, I want to find other people that are being successful who maybe aren't training the way that I'm training so that I can try to understand. And it's, um, I always recommend Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's a really good book. But one of the habits in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is seek first to understand, then to be understood. And what we see with young people a lot is that they have that, you know, no, wait a second, you got to listen kind of attitude because they're seeking to be heard. They're seeking to be understood instead of thinking, hey, what I need to do is understand, you know, especially when you someone, when you look at someone who's more experienced than you, who doesn't agree with you, you need to look at that and ask yourself, why is this happening? So I have to move so I can plug my computer in. 
why is this person not doing what I'm doing? What is it about them? And then you've got to be able to accept that. I'll give you a really good example. The first time I heard Stuart McGill talk, I, up until that point, we were very conventional. You know, we did abs, right? You know, we did crunches, we did sit-ups. And then I go and I listen to Stuart McGill talk and I'm thinking, wow, he's basically saying that a lot of what we're doing is wrong. Now, there were two ways to approach that. One is, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Or two is, oh, this guy's probably one of the leading low back researchers in the world. Why is he saying not to do the stuff that we're doing? And the net result of that is we went back and we stopped all, all flexion-based stuff at that time. We don't do crunches. We don't do sit-ups. We don't do any kind of flexion-oriented abdominals. It, but it was because I heard somebody speak and I came away with the conclusion that this person knew more about that particular area than I did. And that I needed to, you know, instead of arguing with them about their advice, I needed to heed their advice and I needed to go back and make changes in my program. And my staff always used to freak out when I did it. They'd come back and be like, what are you doing? You know, you're saying we can't do all the exercises that we did before. And I'm like, yeah, because we were wrong. <laughs> this guy's way smarter than us. And he says, don't do that. And, and I've had lots of those moments. And that's why I think our program is as good as it is because I continue to have those moments. Does that help? Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. Um, being in the private sector, private sector, um, Cody Boyle, what's the biggest, what's the biggest thing that you could tell me or biggest tip that you could tell me about marketing or marketing strategy? Um, the, the biggest marketing strategy is to do good work because your number one marketing strategy will be word of mouth and you can't undo negative word of mouth. <clears throat> so if the quality of your work is high and I would say, you know, even the quality of what you're doing from an interpersonal standpoint in the private sector really matters. I mean, we, we're very specific about the way we dress, about the music that we play. Like for instance, in our facility, you can't play music that has obscenities in it. I don't allow it. You know, if someone was to come in and put on, you know, a radio station that, that where people were swearing in the music, I would immediately make them change that channel. I don't let our coaches wear shirts without sleeves. I mean, we're really super specific about, we want to portray a certain image so that the word of mouth that we get, you know, the word on the street about us is always really good because you're actually marketing to parents. That's one thing you need to understand. You're not marketing to the kids. You're marketing to their parents and you want the parents to come in and think, this is the kind of place that I want my child to be. These are the kind of people that I want my child to be around. And maybe like for us, because 50% of our business now is adults, we want parents to think this is the kind of place that I could be, that I could feel comfortable. These are the kind of people that I would like to be around. And all that stuff, you know, all the little things matter and all the little things add up to big things. Like even t-shirts, we tell our kids, you can't wear, um, like as for instance, you know, a kid will come in with a Yankee socks t-shirt on. I make them turn it inside out. You know, kids come in with t-shirts, you know, whatever that have alcohol advertisements on them. I make them turn them inside out. You know, we're really specific about what you're going to see when you come into our facility. And we, we know how we want to be perceived by our consumers. So I think that's the biggest thing you know, marketing is not about as much about outreach as it is about the internal things that you're doing, because you have to look, there's a really good book called Raving Fans that you might want to read. And what you want to do is you want to create raving fans who are out there saying that you got to go train with Samuel. You got to be at that facility with this guy because he's unbelievable. Because that's ultimately, we don't spend, honestly, I don't think we spend a, a 10 bucks a year on advertising. All of our advertising is social media which is free. And we don't, I mean, if we do spend money, it's buying ads in a program for, you know, the local high school, someone will come in and say, you know, will you buy an ad for our, you know, in the field hockey program, we'll do stuff like that. And that's more because it's community support than it really is, you know, us perceiving that it would be advertising and that will actually referrals based on that. But you're going to get clients based on referrals more than anything you're going to do from a marketing standpoint. And also the other thing I just say is be conscious of your own social media. Realize that people are going to go back and check you out. Because with anybody now, anytime I see 
You know, anybody that gets in contact with me, first thing I do is click and look at their pictures because I want to know what kind of person I'm dealing with. You know, mm. and if the pictures are all, you know, party pictures and them drinking and them doing whatever, I'm like, okay, then I know that's what kind of person it is. And I think as people have said things to me like, well, you know, I don't want to be judged. People shouldn't judge me. And I'm like, well, then shit, be an artist. You know, do, go do something else. Because in this field, <laughs> people, people are going to judge you. They're, and they're judging you, like particularly in the private sector, they're judging you based on how they feel you will interact with their children. That is the most important thing in the world to them. And so, you know, I always tell people, go in and watch, go look at the facility. Go in, you know, if you go in there and you cringe, you know, you see ugly lifting and you go in there and you hear nasty music where people are swearing and you go in there and the people, you know, the coaches are poorly dressed or they're on their phone or whatever it is. I said, then you can pretty much guarantee that's the place you don't want to be. You know, I had one of my, one of my former athletes, this woman who was a three-time Olympian, took her daughter out of the facility after one day uh, because she was just sitting there watching that a big garage door that was open and her 12 year old was doing safety squats with 135 pounds the first day she was in the facility. And she was like, that shouldn't be happening right now. I'm like, of course it shouldn't. You know, you know better than that. You don't have to ask me that question. And the next day that guy lost business because that kid did not come back and she went and asked for her money back. So you have to, I always, I tell people you have to realize that the kids, not the kids, but the clients that you work with should be the mirror that you see yourself in. So when you look at them training, do you like what you see? Does it give you a good feeling about yourself? And those clients should be the window that everybody else sees you through. I tell our guys to always imagine that someone's looking in the window all the time and they can't hear, they can only see. What's their perception of you as a coach? If they look in and see, like I said, cringeworthy, you know, lifts where you go, oh my God, you know, that kid's going to hurt themselves then that's going to be the impression that they walk away. Hey, I went, I looked at the facility, I saw horrible lifting, kids, you know, unsupervised, terrible technique. That's your word of mouth. Your facility is an unsupervised facility with terrible technique. Or if I went in there and said, wow, the coaches were super professional and they were watching the kids, they were interacting, they weren't, you know, they didn't even have their phones on the floor with them. And they were, you know, they were vocal, they were involved. That's what those people are going to see. Makes sense? Yes, it does. Perfect. We probably got time for three or four more. I got to actually check out here at three and get back to work. But on the, on the terms of creating on the terms of creating a very efficient and productive mindset, what what is your favorite podcast to listen to other than yours? Hmm. You know, I wouldn't say I have a favorite, to be honest, because it's more topical. One of my favorites lately has been this guy, Jake Tura, and it's called the Jacked Athlete Podcast. And I have literally said on every interview that I've done since then that it is the worst named podcast that I've ever listened to. <laughs> the last thing that I want to listen to is a podcast called Jacked Athlete. But this kid, Jake, is a collegiate strength and conditioning coach. And he has unbelievable guests and he asks them really intelligent questions. And I'm almost like, can you please change the name? <laughs> it's a terrible name, but I, I really like that. I like, there's another one called leave your mark. Then does Scott interviews some of the top people in the field and it's all about their life, which I find really intriguing because he spends hour talking to people about, you know, kind of where they grew up, what their influences were. And I think that stuff can be really positive. So I, I like, I like his, um, I, I like uh, Rob Pacey, Pacey performance. I, I enjoy depending, you know, but I will kind of sometimes pick topically sometimes, uh, you know, if it's too sports science, yeah, I might skip the episode, but I like, I like his, I'm trying to think of if there's others that I really gravitate towards. Those would be probably three of the ones I enjoy the most. All right, and I need to ask you, um, M-A-I-R-E, what does that spell? Um, it's Myre, like Myre. Myre, okay. Perfect. It's Finnish. It's Finnish? Oh, 
you are not blonde. I don't know all the Finnish people I know are blonde. Yeah, my my mom's from Finland, came to Washington State to study. Um, at my dad, who's from Alaska, they both played hockey, both did bodybuilding, powerlifting. So I must have gotten my dad's hair color. <laughs> awesome. Well, I was going to say, because I was going to say you haven't asked the question yet. So I was going to, I'm looking at yours sitting up there. So, I mean, because you are so uh, well known for your experience with hockey, how do you find opportunities like that? I mean, is there? I think that, you know, the good thing is there's hockey opportunities are, I think are always on the increase. And particularly like in your case, women's hockey's op opportunities are even more on the increase just because that game is expanding. You know, I think, you know, uh, sports like women's hockey and lacrosse are really growing probably at a rate that a lot of the others are not. But I think the big thing is to go where the opportunity is. So, you know, in terms of, and I don't know what, uh, I don't know if you're a graduate student, undergrad student, whatever it is, but trying to go someplace and get experience with people that are doing what you want to do, because again, part of joining the, the network. And that's what I always tell the kids that work for me. I'm like, Hey, if you want to work in hockey, I'm a good guy to come and work for because I have a lot of people that have worked for me that are working in hockey, you know, be it men's or women's, but you know, all over the, the world, but definitely all over the United States. And um, so I think sometimes people don't kind of make the right choice when they're thinking about um, internships or about experiences and they kind of go, they choose something more based on convenience as, and sometimes it's the, the sacrifice. Like we've had some great international interns who've made ridiculous sacrifices to have the internship. And then a year or two down the road, it really pays off for them by, because they end up getting a job uh, because of the internship. And I think that's a big piece of the puzzle for people is make sure that you get to the place. And like, if you think I should meet this person, meet them. So like, if you're, are you from Alaska? Where do you live? I'm from Boise, Idaho. So lacrosse and hockey are not big over here. Not big in Boise, Idaho. No, they are not. No, but it's because I have two, uh, it's funny. I had two girls that lived with us one summer from Alaska sisters one played at northeast one played at minnesota duluth one was on the has made a couple of u.s national teams but they knew that or they thought they wanted to get into strength and conditioning and they knew my daughter through hockey and they talked to my daughter and they literally ended up coming and living in my basement for a summer and working at the gym and uh zoe pickle the older one is now an assistant coach at ohio state and assistant hockey coach but it's figuring out what you want and then saying, okay, how do I get what I want? How do I go to where I need to go and get what I need to get? Um, because I think too few people do that, I think. And that's what separates sort of the, you know, the people who get what they want generally are the people who have a really good approach to going to get it. And the people who don't get what they want are generally people who find themselves sitting around and saying, you know, they're, they're the people. So I sent out a hundred resumes. And those are the people that I laugh at, like, yeah, that's great. You sent out on your resumes, but that, that is not, that's not a way to get a job. You want to get a job. You know, if you made a hundred, if you told me I made a hundred site visits, I went and met a hundred strength and conditioning coaches, or I visited a hundred private facilities or whatever it was, and I didn't get a job, I'd be shocked. So um, that would, that'd be my two cents. But So. Thank you. No problem. Last question. If we got one, anybody? Hey, Cassidy, uh, do you have a question? Um, I do not have any questions. I guess uh, one question I had is, uh, you know, since we're in the coronavirus pandemic, uh, you know, what, what would be like the best piece of advice you would give for all of us to get through these tough times and to, you know, kind of like make the best out of the situation that we currently have. Well, one, I'd say use the time to your advantage. There's been a huge number of free clinics and free opportunities that people have put on the internet in terms of the ability to, to gain knowledge, to listen to lectures. I think, I think it was Elon that actually did a virtual internship for people last summer. And I think they're doing another one, but it would, again, it would be figuring out a way, how do I capitalize? 
how do I make the best of a bad situation? And that might be by signing up for Elon's virtual internship. It might be by, um, you know, getting on every one of these free webinars that somebody puts on. I mean, obviously you guys, I'm preaching to the choir a little bit because you're, you're here doing this already, but it's really taking advantage of those opportunities and using the time as best you can. But it's also, it's the, there's a difference between networking and resumes. I always think I tell everybody, you know, you should be on Instagram, you should be on Twitter, you should be following people on both of those platforms. And if you want to get to know people, sometimes it's as simple as writing a simple response. Hey, thanks. That was a great post, whatever it is. You know what I mean? Something don't go on and get into the argument. Don't go on and get into the mud. Just go on and get into a situation where people start to, to know that you're there. Um, my friend, Alan Cosgrove, I forget whose book it was from, but he always talks about top of mind awareness. You want to create that top of mind awareness with the people that you want to be around. So that when they're thinking, hey, I need an intern or hey, I have an opportunity, then who is it that I'm thinking about when I have that opportunity? Well, it's the person that's at the top of my mind. It's not someone I haven't heard from in a year who suddenly sends me an email and says, hey, you know, you know about any jobs? And I'm like, oh, I forgot you even interned. I forgot you existed because you haven't, you know, there is some work that's required to develop and maintain a network. It's not much different than a garden. You've got to be thinking, okay, I've got to develop this network. I've got to maintain this network. Like, like, will you go out as a result of this webinar? And it's an, and don't do it because I told you to do it. But what you should do in a situation like this is you should get the presenter's email address and just send them a thank you email. Hey, it was great. I really appreciate you taking an hour because suddenly I look at that and think, you know, whether it's my, it's Michael, whether it's Caroline, I'm like, I remember those names. They were the people that were on the webinar. And so suddenly now we have the beginnings of a relationship. I know you, you know me. And then it might be a month later, just say, I had a question about this. And, you know, continuing to grow those relationships with people. Cause I have relationships now with people and that's how I started. I used to literally call, uh, I called, I, I'll tell you, and I, I'm going, a little bit longer. I hope I'm not keeping anybody, but um, Mike Stone, who, if you're, again, if you're a student of strength and conditioning, Stone wrote like the original periodization articles, but I had a question about one of the articles and this was in the pre-email telephone days. And I just figured out where he worked. I saw the article said he works at the National Strength Research Center at Auburn University. So I got on the phone, I dialed 411 and I said, can I have the number for the National Strength Research Center at Auburn University? And lo and behold, they gave it to me. And I called up and I said, is Dr. Stone available? And someone said, yeah, I'll get him for you. And within like five minutes, I had Mike Stone on the phone and I was asking him questions about the article. I did the same thing with Don Chu. You know, I had an article about an article, a question about an article that he wrote. And I just found out where he worked, called information, called up, said, is Don Chu available to speak for a minute? Someone put him on the line. But now those are people that, I, that I've since met and interacted with later on you know, in my professional life, but initially I was somebody like you, I was a, you know, a 20 something year old kid with a question, but I figured, Hey, what the heck, go right to the source, get the answer to the question and hopefully start to create at least some imprint where, Hey, that person who's an authority now knows that I exist. I'm, you know, I'm at least a blip on the radar for that person. So think about that ability to, and, and to create, the network that you want so that eventually you, know, you get the, the break that you want. All right. Well, Hey, it was a pleasure. I thanks cause our fly, but you have to go and uh, get back to real life there. Thank you guys all for, uh, for taking the time. It was a pleasure.